Hey everyone, and welcome to The Private Podcast, where we plug in and explore the intersection of privacy, human rights, technology, and democracy. I'm your host, Derek E. Silva. Today, we're speaking with Jeff Roberts. Jeff is the executive editor at Decrypt, a former lawyer and staff writer at Fortune, and has reported on crypto since 2013. He is OG for sure. He is the author of the 2019 book about Coinbase, Kings of Crypto, one startup's quest to take cryptocurrency out of Silicon Valley and onto Wall Street. I guess one could argue they've been fairly successful at that so far. Uh, And one interesting fact about Jeff is that he owns less than one Bitcoin and less than five Ethereum. So I guess he doesn't have a particularly strong agenda uh, uh, on either of those topics if if we bring them up today. Uh, Jeff, thanks so much for taking the time to be here today. I know you're on a tight schedule. Uh, Derek, great to be back. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem. It was nice to see you at the private virtual summit back in March. Now we got you on the podcast here, and uh, we'll get to focus on you for a little bit because I think you were a moderator at the time, so uh, you actually get a chance to say your your bit instead. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about your background and what inspired you to become a journalist? You were a lawyer before that. Um, yeah, I like writing, and you know, being a lawyer gives you an excuse to do that. But writing legal briefs <laughs> is a bit like writing car manuals all day. So um, journalism is fun because you get to speak to interesting people and try to tell their stories. And every day is something new. So that's what I like to do. Um, and um, I was a longtime reporter at Fortune magazine, where I covered business and tech broadly. And I joined um, a publication called Decrypt uh, early this March. And what we're trying to do is basically what Wired did for tech. Uh, 20 mm-hmm. years ago, we're trying to do for crypto because um, crypto, you know, can seem narrow and weird, but actually it's the intersection of, um, you know, economics and culture and finance and history. And, um, you know, I would argue privacy too. So it's, um, uh, yeah, so that's sort of uh, what's new with me, I guess. Yeah, I just saw a headline this morning that said uh, the number of Bitcoin ATMs has doubled since j- since this January, which is obviously incredibly quick growth considering those have been rolling out for years now. And uh, and this is definitely, uh, I think, the narrative that I'm starting to hear a lot more often in mainstream media is the fact that cryptocurrencies are coming and they are being adopted en, en masse. There are hotels you can book with Bitcoin now and stuff like that. And uh, whether some people like it or not. Oh, and and of course, EA is now uh, looking at uh, embedding NFTs in their games and, and things like that. When you have a multi-billion dollar game publisher, game publisher like Electronic Arts uh, uh, and Ubisoft before them taking NFTs seriously. You know, I, I think the, the momentum is clearly on the side of the people who are actually working in the space and reporting on it like yourself. Um, yeah, and I mean, this week, too, brought news of Facebook, you know, rebranding as the metaverse, which, you know, I think <laughs> is going to have a heavy crypto component to it, too. I mean, it's sounds a little dystopian, but uh, it's uh, it's all around us, that's for sure. Uh, yeah, I guess. Hmm, I, I heard someone say recently, and personally, I agree that uh, it's not I, it, it's hard to call any platform like that a metaverse unless it actually has something like nfts where the the assets and the you know the game collectibles and stuff like that you buy are actually portable is that like is that the sort of thing you guys are talking about in the newsroom at all whether it's virtual or physical at this point yeah that's a that's a really interesting question because we're debating what is the metaverse and does facebook's thing qualify i mean i think cryptocurrency and tokens and nfts is certainly a part of it but Another big part of it is open versus closed. It's um, Mm -hmm. fascinating to me to watch um, the debate over, you know, remember in the 90s, you know, the internet was supposed to be like AOL's kind of walled garden and, you know, Microsoft where they sort of try to, you know, define the scope of the of the internet to the things they pick and yeah. i think with we're seeing that happen again is the whole point of web3 is it's supposed to be decentralized where there's no one really one company defining its rules or controlling it but of course you know that's just not the way the world works and so i think facebook wants to have a metaverse but on their terms mm-hmm, mm-hmm. i i hope you know, I, i'm not a big fan of the platform i, I try not to use it uh, I, I try to use it as little as possible I do hope that they are that they do make things more open as opposed to like you need to port everything to Facebook's own blockchain or, um, you know, they make their own new standard, you know, ERC 721s and 1155s are out. We have this new thing instead. That would be really, really annoying. And ultimately, I think it would hurt the adoption of anything they build. So I, I'm, I'm hopeful that they will stick with what's available. Um, 
we'll probably need to do some bridging. Uh, uh, you know, certainly I don't want to pay fifty dollars to bring a, uh, an NFT into um, uh, Facebook's platform, but uh, yeah, that's that's fine. Uh, we roll back a little bit. You re you released a, a book back in twenty nineteen uh, about Coinbase. Uh, tell us about the the book, the inspiration for that, and uh, uh, maybe how it was received at the time. Yeah, it came out, uh, my goodness, what time? Yeah, you're right. It was 2019. It's, it's funny, I don't know about you, but the world's been a time warp last couple of years. That was came out in December of that year. Um, yeah. There's other books of, on crypto out there, some very good ones. The Age of Cryptocurrency is good. And then Digital Gold, which told the original story of Bitcoin. But I want to find a new way to tell the story, but more recent events. And um, companies are just a vehicle to, you know, if you want to understand, like, the history of, you know, sneakers, a story on you know, a book on Nike would be a good way to do that. So um, I knew, you know, I covered Coinbase since the very beginning. So I thought it would be an interesting way to just sort of tell the story of how crypto went mainstream. So that's the vehicle I did, just sort of focusing on the characters who built Coinbase, but also using that as a vehicle to tell the larger story of crypto and how it went from, you know, sort of this sort of small cliquey thing with a few Bitcoin OGs to became something that, you know, tens of millions of uh, Americans now own. Terrific. Uh, what was the what was the reception like at the time? Like, was it uh, was it kind of mixed reviews? Was it largely positive? Uh, no, they hated it. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. It was a <laughs> it was a pleasant surprise. I, uh, uh, you know, because you know you write these things and they're out, which is great. You know, but uh, no, I was it's written up in the Economist and the New York Times, and it's got uh, very good reviews so far. I'm not just saying that. It's uh, you know I've assembled them on the website for it. So um, so what I want to do that was different was make this um, accessible to other people, make it mm -hmm. readable because I think a lot of you know as with tech, there's an impulse to sort of you know have an in group and if you're not in the clique you know you don't understand the language and the jargon so i just want to tell a story in a way that anyone could understand um and you know apparently i succeeded in doing that or well some people say i did so i'm happy with that terrific uh, i i will say you know you could probably guess by the questions i haven't read it yet but i am going to add it to my to my list and uh, uh of books to read because uh i i think it's great to get insider content uh, on stuff like that, especially for a company that is so large at this point, sometimes controversial, um, but regardless, certainly has, I, I think, cemented their place in, in this ecosystem, uh, regardless of what happens next, at least over the short to medium term. Um, you, We mentioned off the top that you have one le less than one Bitcoin, uh, less than five Ethereum. I actually just heard uh, earlier this week that uh, The Verge uh, has a policy of uh, any journalist not being able to own any crypto uh, that works for The Verge. Uh, sounds like Decrypt doesn't have quite so strict of a policy, but are you? do you hold any other cryptocurrencies as well? Or are you using any, uh, actively using any platforms, maybe a DeFi platform or anything like that? Yeah, no, I mean, the reason for that policy, of course, is conflict of interest. You know, I know yes. I used to work at the news agency Reuters, and if you covered a company, you couldn't own their stock. Because, right. you know, you have inside information and also just makes you biased. You don't want to, you know, and crypto especially, you know, most people into crypto are, you know, including some journalists, unfortunately, are, you know, horribly like bullish on it all the time. It's because they're, <laughs> you know, either deliberately or trying to pump it or just, you know, it's, it's, it's just, you know, if you invested in something, it shapes how you describe and cover it. Um, uh, decrypt, you're right, isn't as strict as The Verge, but, uh, you know, the rules uh, editor-in-chief Dan Roberts and I made are like, you can own a bit, but you have to disclose it. Um, but, you know, we also think it's good to own some because crypto is a complicated technology. And if you want to write about it, you need to understand it. So, you know, I have a little bit of Ethereum I play with in terms of like I signed on to the game the other night, Axie Infinity, you know, just to mm -hmm. make sure you understand the wallets and how NFTs work. And to do that, you need Ethereum. So right. for that reason, I own a little bit and I try stuff out here and there, you know, just to make sure, you know, you know how stuff works. Um, I poke yeah. around the DeFi protocols a bit. I haven't put any money in, but it's, um, you know, the interesting thing for me too right now is just how complicated the user interface is. I mean, I there's this game called Axie Infinity that's now has 2 million people. It's worth, you know, billions of dollars and it's where people, you know, play with NFTs. It says like, I should finally try this. And my God, what a horrible experience in terms of use of things. You have to get Ethereum and then move it to a MetaMask wallet and then transfer it to the game. And they charge me a hundred bucks to transfer it for the gas fees. And then you get, they're like, okay, now you need to buy these creatures to play. And they all started a hundred dollars. I'm like, this feels more like a pyramid oh scheme than a game. Um, 
but yeah, for that reason, I think it's uh, it's good to you know if you're covering you know sort of like if you were uh, a reporter who covered cars, you know, it's you probably would be a good idea to let you know to drive them. So it's the same principle <laughs> with with crypto. So yes, if you if you work for uh, uh, Jalopnik or Motor Trend, you probably don't take public transit every day. It's not a terrible thing, but you probably should own a car and understand, and, and maybe even rent one every once in a while. That's not part of your uh, your review uh, stream, so you can get get that experience. But uh, yeah, that, it would certainly be odd if if you were like a bike a cycling maxi, but <laughs> you're writing for motor. Exactly. Trend. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> um, can you tell us a little bit more about your role as executive editor at Decrypt? Uh, like, what does that actually mean for your day to day, and uh, and and how big is the team now? Uh, it's, yeah, it's for the title. I'm not really sure. They wanted me to pick a title. I was like, that sounds cool. That sounds important. So, um, uh, Dan Roberts, no relation, is the editor in chief. Uh, he's a former colleague at Fortune and was hosted Yahoo Finance. Um, he asked me to come over, so I did. So my job is basically I. I'm still primarily a writer, but I, you know, coach some of the younger reporters sometimes and, uh, you know, put on events and do emceeing and stuff like that. So cool. um, the team is, um, you know, there's sort of, it's, it's an interesting too. crypto media is evolving quickly. The original one was, of course, Coindesk and, you know, they're still there. Um, there's a site called The Block that does good things. Um, yeah. The crypt, as I say, we're trying to do like, you know, what, what Wired did, you know, when the internet came around, you know, there's like internet publications and trade publications, but Wired did something more. They told about like the people and the culture and that. So that's what Decrypt is doing. Um, it was started by a guy named Joe Lubin, who is one of the co-founders of Ethereum and runs a company right. called Consensus. But we, um, we have no, uh, we have no, you know, he doesn't interfere in the editorial stuff because, you know, he always got this like, oh, you guys are pro Ethereum. It's like, no, no, this guy has nothing to do with their day-to-day -day life. So, um, the most interesting thing we're doing now, our team is we're probably up to about you know eight reporters and editors plus some contributors. But we recently launched something called a DAO, which is a um, decentralized autonomous organization. And it's right. interesting how fast tech moves, but how fast crypto is moving. Uh, DAOs are now a big thing. You're probably familiar with a platform called Discord, which is um, mm -hmm. you know very popular with the the gaming community. But it's also crypto is all the, you know, all the crypto action is on Discord, which is I'm trying to think how to describe it. Uh, you know, maybe you can, Derek. Have you been on there? It Oh, yeah. It's, if I look at my screen time on my MacBook, it's like the second most used app. Firefox first and then Discord right after. Uh, it is like Internet Relay Chat, IRC, um, because it has discrete channels. And it has lots of commands you can do with text, but you also have emoji and stickers and gifs and threads and uh, you know and and roles and well I guess you had roles before but you can do token gated channels and stuff like that that a lot more a far more robust API than uh, IRC ever had. Uh, it it's also similar to Telegram except that uh, Telegram you need to make whole new groups uh, for different things if you wanted to separate topics. Um, Discord, you can have a single server and, uh, uh, you know, 50 channels, 100 channels with categories and everything else. And, uh, yeah, it's 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 a really customized and, and beefed up IRC for anybody who remembers IRC. And otherwise, it's just a really robust chat platform uh, that you can do a whole bunch of uh, apps and things like that on top of. Yeah, that's a great description. I mean, I was, <clears throat> pardon me, um, a little bit familiar with it um, through, you know, gaming. I don't do a lot of gaming, but I have a friend in Canada who we'll meet up and, you know, play games sometimes. We use it to talk. But in crypto, you know, my goodness, it is just like absolutely pervasive. So um, and on Discord has also turned into an organizing forum for DAOs, so those decentralized mm -hmm. autonomous organizations um, where a bunch of people who don't know each other come together. And spin things up. We're actually launched one for journalism where we are, you know, actually publishing with, you know, across multiple platforms and soliciting ideas. And there's even going to be a token component where, you know, stewards and token owners can sort of suggest things to cover. Um, you know, obviously it's touchy with media because, you know, we can't see the person with the most money shouldn't be able to tell us what to do. So we're just experimenting with that right now. But it's a very kind of interesting and trying to think of you know, DAOs are most famous because that's what started Ethereum. And of course, that, you know, ended badly in a sense because it dissolved into infighting and someone hacked it and, you know, they embezzled the money and they got it back, all that. So that was all in 20, I think maybe before, yeah, 2016 was the Ethereum 
hack um and that's yeah. to put ba DAOs in a bad light um and so you know we all kind of forgot about them for a while but now they're everywhere and they're being used for all sorts of things someone likened it to like spinning up a hollywood production if you want to make a movie you know it's not a permanent company you bring a bunch of people together you get actors and a director and extras and prop people and you all you know convene with some money and um you know you do what you do and then the movie goes out and everyone moves on that seems to be a bit of what DAOs are all about. It's sort of like these, uh, you know, instant communities, but with a with a checkbook because they issue tokens, you know, most of them, and you can use that to allocate, you know, the money to work on things. I mean, I'm still finding this quite new, and I, yeah. you know, have some misgivings about it, but it's really, uh, you know, <laughs> kind of a big thing, for lack of a better way to put it. So, are, are you familiar with DAOs, or you must have encountered it at some point? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, I do, I guess, like full disclosure type of thing. I, I do support the Gitcoin DAO uh, with some execution stuff or for their Discord server. Uh, they need to add new channels. They need to invite new bots to do various things. Uh, I'm one of the people who helps uh, manage a lot of that so that the core team that still exists at Gitcoin is still running hackathons and, and doing all that other core corporate stuff that still currently exists during this transition to a fully decentralized organization also part of consensus uh i, I guess another disclosure there um and uh yeah so i've i've been seeing that it's it yeah it's tough like it is you know getting uh, trying to organize 150 200 people who are all effectively working part-time um you know it's it's like watching in one way, it's like watching my former manager at Walmart try to, you know, figure out scheduling and who is going to work and, you know, letting people switch shifts and stuff like that, but making sure all the work gets still gets done in a timely manner. And um, so it, it's it's different. Uh, yes, there's token involved, uh, tokens involved, and, and that's one of the primary payments for these part time contributors who are, you know, playing their role. And um, yeah, and it, it's been it's really interesting to see this. A whole host of similar experiments uh, really play out. Bankless uh, has a, a fairly well-running DAO. I'm actually part of one called Perion, who runs uh, a couple of validator nodes. I'm part of the XDAI validator node through Perion. And um, yeah, there's, there's all sorts of different flavors and structures as well uh, at this point. What you just remind, what you just said, though, about um, you know launching a DAO and having a token and all that reminded me of Civil, which launched a few years ago. It was supposed to be uh, uh dis well not decentralized necessarily but uh, a, a platform to fund and, and help make sustainable newsrooms uh in local uh, you know more localized uh, uh newsrooms i think there was one in colorado um and a few others they shut down uh a little over a year ago i think actually joined the consensus team has that Assuming that team's still part of consensus in some way, do you know if they've had an impact on on moving decrypt in this direction? Um, because that I thought that was a really really interesting um, project back in 2016, 2017 uh, when I joined the industry, and uh, unfortunately it failed at the time. But I think it might have just been too early, and and potentially it's morphed into what you guys are doing now. Yeah, no, that's it's fascinating. It sounds like you're more even deeper in this stuff than I am. It's, it's <laughs> neat just how many worlds, it's... you know, the Discord DAOs, it's everywhere. But <clears throat> question about um, uh, Civil, our um, our founder, Ryan Brucky, who's the guy who started Code Academy, hates that question because, you know, when they were pushing to go do this DAO thing, you know, me and Dan, the editor in chief, were like, yo, you know, remember Civil? It's, you know, because I, I used to be a reporter. Well, I'm still a reporter, but I used to, you know, cover media companies too. And I remember covering Civil and, Mm -hmm. going like okay i sort of get this you know new models of journalism we're all for that but big warning flag to me was i was talking to a lot of people involved and they couldn't explain it and that's always a warning sign doesn't yeah. mean it's wrong but it's just like it's too early and then like the handful of people who did were like oh this is a future why are you asking this of course it's gonna be this way and so you know i think that was like it just i think you're right it was before it's time um, you know, people just weren't familiar with it in retrospect it sort of makes sense um but also there they ran into trouble was that was the ico model the initial coin yeah. offering and remember like all these projects like you know tezos a lot of big crypto things were like sell all these tokens make a hundred million dollars and you have a treasury you're set um and then, and then we'll the uh, se 
yeah, but then the SEC came in in 2017. It's like, yo, you can't run around selling, you know, it amounts to like selling stock without a license. So we're yeah. going to sue you if you do that. So that's what happened to Civil. They, they did not do their ICO mm -hmm. in time. And then meanwhile, it's just the complexity of it. You know, it's like, okay, you're going to have governance tokens, you have reader tokens. And it's just, there's too much to explain to people. And I think the complexity is, is you know, sort of always an enemy of getting stuff done. This time around, um, there's a lot more infrastructure. There's the amount of people who know how blockchains work is, you know, 10x what it was when Civil was starting out. Yeah. Um, you know, there's more money to support it. There's just a lot more infrastructure. So, um, you know, I think it's, you know, and of course, we're not betting with farm on this, too. We also have, a, it's funny not to, you know, take you behind the curtain or how the sausage is made, but there's always debates over like, you know, whether we're to web web 2.0, which is where you put, you know, stories on the internet, sell advertising against it and have like, you know, that, you know, an advertised based web model, which keeps the lights on. But of course, we right. know, you know, the whole idea of pushing into, um, you know, doing a DAO and doing a web three, you know, civil style thing is to escape the big, you know, tech monopolists of Google and Facebook that's, you know, not only take all the advertising money, but lead to a very crappy user experience. I mean, that's why a lot of the web sucks is because it's advertising driven and it fuels mm -hmm. things like publishing clickbait. So you can, you know, you know, try to get another page for you. And, you know, the money comes from some like crappy, you know, automated ad. So, sorry, I'm probably going, you know, way too far with this, but the That's idea is okay. to find a new business model for media and, uh, you know, Web 3.0 is what, um, I'm sorry, uh, I don't know where that's from. Um, anyways, <laughs> yeah, so that's what we're, uh, that's what we're doing right now. I'm sorry, my phone just rang. I'm not supposed to do that in podcast. Um, anyways, that's yes, okay. that's, that's the latest. Cool. Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to dive deep now because I want to, want to get to some more questions, but I'm now, I'm just thinking of how you could still maybe have uh you know a more web 2.0 style for people who simply cannot afford to pay for decrypt at all right especially people in emerging countries and and uh or emerging economies developing countries venezuela botswana what have you um but maybe a pro version that doesn't have any and of course you know what does that mean maybe it's selling a token and then staking the token with decrypt on some sort of platform or a farm or something that wraps into a DeFi 2.0 thing where you guys are actually, you know, putting that token somewhere, earning revenue on it. And if I don't want the, the pro version anymore, I can withdraw and sell and, and do whatever I want and I go and go back to the web based uh, uh, or to the ad based version. <laughs> anyway, uh, well, we can have that conversation another time, but um, I just it, it'd be really interesting to see maybe that sort of thing come out where uh uh you know i gotta i gotta show you i want to i want to stay uh, uh a pro member without having to persistently buy more and buy more and buy more but if i stake them instead you guys could earn an income uh a revenue you know putting those in a liquidity pool or something like that something similar to olympus dow or fay protocol or wonderland where the protocol so i guess the decrypt protocol actually collects all the revenue and me as a staker, I also got a portion um, that could maybe be a, a, a new business model for for that sort of thing. But um, I'll let you guys figure that. Yeah, out. the possibilities <laughs> are just endless. It's no, it's it's just such a neat frontier. Like what we're discussing internally is like what is Web three? Um, you know the parable of like the blind scientists and the elephant. You know these three scientists mm -hmm. who are blind and they're trying to figure out what an elephant is. And one guy's touching the trunk and it's like, oh, it's this. And someone else is touching the tail, but it's just too yeah. big and too hard to see all of it. And that's where we are right now. So just but the, you know, the potential for ideas. And it's really exciting because we were sort of trapped in this horrible world of Facebook and Google only. And this is the first, you know, as a tech reporter, I always get these pitches. Oh, we're going to, you know, disrupt Facebook or Google. And, you know, I had like 100 companies pitch me that. And like, no, you're not because these are big, powerful monopolies and they're not going anywhere. Yeah. But this is the first time I've actually seen something that has the potential to kind of transcend that and, you know, get us beyond that, which I think is is really exciting. And one more thing I want to add, you're mentioning um, 
you know, people with different incomes in other countries, um, going back to Axie Infinity, that game. So it's discussing internally. I was like, why is anyone doing this? This is a horrible experience. But I've got a colleague in Venezuela who is like, hey, half like the teenagers here are making a living off this. And so are people yeah. in the Philippines and stuff because people basically, you know, rent out their Axies, their NFTs to, you know, go earn money on. And just the, you know, the economics are, and, you know, people are saying in terms of the labor market, you know, once upon a time you work at Walmart or McDonald's, now, you know, the competitor is not just like Kentucky Fried Chicken or Target. It's these online games and people are, would rather <laughs> spend their time, you know, working, playing games. And, you know, and it's, 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 it's just a fascinating phenomenon. It's, it's so early. I don't know what it all means, but there's something happening here. <laughs> In one way, I feels like it feels like we're heading towards Ready Player One uh, and potentially the very dystopian version of that where people literally just make a living or, you know, they spend all day jacked into some crazy VR get up or, or even just sitting in front of a laptop all day, which, you know, as, as, well, as somebody who probably anyways, sits at a yeah, desk so, all day, yeah. yeah, as somebody who probably sits at a desk all day, we know it's not great for your body. So I'm not, I'm not sure that's, that's the best option, but if it's, you know, part-time DAO work, part-time uh, play to earn work, uh, you know, doing something like Axie Infinity and you get up and go for a walk in between, maybe it's not terrible. Um, but I, I, I think what's great is that, th that that opportunity exists, right? You do have a different option instead of backbreaking back work in a warehouse or, or you know, getting up at 4 a.m. to go work in a restaurant all day or something like that, which I've done. It's not it's not the most glamorous work by any means. Um, you could, you know, make a decent living at least playing a game, renting out your, your, you know, leveling up your Axie or whatever and selling it off or renting it out. And there's actually, um, uh, I think it's a DAO called Yield Guild that I just heard about on Kevin Rose's new podcast, Modern Finance, where they, that's what they're doing. They're actually, they're actually borrowing those, I think somebody else plays with it, levels it up, they borrow it, they do something else with it, and they're earning an income that way, like the the, the, the DAO is earning an income that way, and I'm like, that's really interesting. Um, or they're buying somebody else's accident and then renting it out themselves, like somebody, you know, somebody who's already leveled one up or, or what have you. So yeah, it's, it's turning into employment models, business models uh, that I think everybody's still wrapping their head around and which all might fail. We have no idea. Like, you know, anytime you join a new DeFi community and you're like, hey, so like, what are the prospects here? Well, the reality is everything could go to zero. Like we, we or, or damn near zero. As long as there, as long as there are buyers, you know, it, it could never be zero, but uh, uh, it could get damn close and, um, you know, could all fall apart. But like I said earlier, I think the headwinds are definitely in heading in this direction where something like this, at least, is, is part of the future. Um, you know, I don't think we can decentralize every last little thing, but uh, but I think there are lots of things we can decentralize and, and get back to part of the utopia, you know, cypherpunks and the people who invented the internet in the first place had envisioned back in the uh, the 80s and 90s. Yeah, sticking with that for one sec, we had a dinner last night. I'm in Boulder, Colorado, and there's a lot of crypto OGs here. And this guy named Eric Voorhees, who's sort of a famous oh, yeah. old school Bitcoin guy and libertarian. And he's got a company called Shapeshift that, you know, helps you move, yep. you know, convert one cryptocurrency into another. And he says they're in the process of dissolving the com company to become a DAO. And he's planning to, like, right. fire himself as CEO sometime next month. So <laughs> it's, you know. Next month. Wow. That, you know, so it's. Yeah, but the it's it's trying to decide if this is like you know a you know a utopia or this is better you know and in some ways it could be but it also could be you know very terrible because you know it's even the worst jobs like at you know McDonald's or you know sort of low level service sector jobs there is minimum wage laws you know you're not allowed to be you know there's civil rights laws that you know your boss can't right. you know call you racist names or you know things like that i mean it's not like it always works but there are some basic worker protections and then you sort of see with these DAOs, you know and i've heard some of them are to sort of run by tyrants and what if you go and you know 
go to work, you know, your ass off to get some tokens and they just, you know, rug pull and they're gone. There's no sort of recourse for that. So, but then apparently there's a site sprung up, maybe you know of it, that uh, is sort of um, vets DAO's reputation, which is an interesting way to do it because suppose you're a 15 year old somewhere and you want to, you know, donate your labor and your time and your passion to it. You know, you probably want to make yeah. sure, you know, you're treated okay. And, you know, it's a good way, you know, outside of the government to just have a sort of a reputation check. So it's, yeah, it's, you know, once again, it's just also new, also interesting what it means. I really don't know yet, but. Very good. Yeah, I haven't seen that site yet, but I'll, I'll have to check it out. Um, coming back around to, to Decrypt, what are some of the most important or maybe most read stories uh, that Decrypt has reported on uh, this past year? Well, most read, <clears throat> I beg your pardon. Um, I'm embarrassed to say it's like Dogecoin goes up, Shiba Inu goes up, Dogecoin crashes. You know, it's still a lot of the like mainstream interest is, is just kind of like tokens going up and down. But the you know, sort of deeper, more profound stuff is the you know reporting we've done on DAOs, on NFTs, and this emerging Web three economy. You know, and then you know I do stories on you know regulatory stuff. The stuff happening in Washington right now is is very interesting. Watching like the American government come very late to crypto and try to get its mm -hmm. arms around it, and you know what seems like very clumsy ways. Watching them. Um, a guy named Gary Gansler, who's the chair of the Securities and Exchange Commission, very ambitious guy. Rumors are he wants to be Treasury Secretary. He was Hillary Clinton's kind of finance guy. So he's trying to, you know, make a name for himself by bringing crypto to heel. And, you know, I think a lot yeah. of people say with policies that are not very constructive, but because he's more interested in his political ambition and pleasing people like Elizabeth Warren than he is in developing sound policies. So that's another big theme, just a disconnect between you know, our readers, the people building these things, and then the people in charge of our government. And part of that is just the function of like, President Biden is 80 years old, Janet Yellen 75 years old. I'm not saying, you know, mm -hmm. older people are yeah. ignorant or should be, dis you know, dismissed. But, you know, I remember when I first entered the workforce, uh, email was sort of a new thing. And I remember having older colleagues who didn't want to use email because they wanted printed out. And, you know, if, you know, if you were entering the job market, you couldn't do that. You're like, I won't use that. Everyone had to use it because that's how it went. But if you were in that position of power, you, you know, and you're in your sixties, you could say, okay, everyone print out my emails so I can see them. You know, I don't know if that makes sense, but I'm just saying this sort of problem, yeah, I think, it, of it having takes much very old people to... running our society. Yeah. It just takes much. It's hard to wrap your head around. Uh, I, I think of a, a completely new completely different concept once you're i don't know probably past 40 and i'm almost there like you know some of these new projects come up and i'm like why like what's the point point? and yet there are hundreds or maybe thousands of people who are like yes this totally makes sense uh you know and there's there's you know fairly new web 2.0 apps like like tiktok i have i want nothing to do with tiktok uh, partially because of the algorithm, partially because of the privacy policy, partially because of the 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 whole issue with uh, uh, the the company still being Chinese owned and and knowing what China likes to do with all the data that it it can suck in, like the the Chinese Communist Party, and and ultimately just I just I don't need a new thing. I, I certainly don't need a new thing that's going to suck up you know is literally looking to suck up as much of my screen time as possible. Um, you know I have far more important things to do <laughs> with my time. Um, but yeah, there, there are just, you know, there are, I have, I don't have a Snapchat account. I don't have a TikTok account. I don't, I don't want one. And, and so, you know, I'm almost 40. And so I'm already there with, with, you know, fairly typical social media apps or social networking apps at that point, I can only imagine how I might feel at 75 or 80 thinking, okay, so you want to have people, you know, host servers in their house or mine a cryptocurrency or you know I, I i gotta i gotta hold the keys to my own wallet and if i lose it everything's just gone right like that's those are daunting concepts for all sorts of people um and and so i i, I can certainly understand the hesitation but at the same time you know when you have literally millions of americans and uh, probably hundreds of thousands of canadians and millions of other people all over the world participating and, and actively using, uh, you know, this infrastructure and the dApps and the wallets and all that, I don't think you have a choice. Like you do eventually have to at least get somebody on your team who can figure it out and explain it to you and, and explain how to have regulations that actually do protect people as opposed to 
just coming down hard and and preventing things from happening in the first place. And this has happened by both Republicans and Democrats in the, in, in the U.S. Um, you know, both both sides of, of that political equation have come down incredibly hard, at least at the state level, um, and and just preventing things from happening. And uh, you know, when you when you hear the rhetoric, from, especially from Republicans, about like freedom and free trade, etc. All I can sit here and think is like, well, then what are you doing? Like, it, I understand you want to protect people, but, you know, it, it seems like you're protecting them from an opportunity to actually earn a little bit of money as opposed to protecting them from from the downside of putting a few hundred or maybe a few thousand dollars into something. Um, yeah, it's it's just it's it's I don't I'm not saying Canada's doing any better, but I I think we're doing think our government or at least Canada Revenue Agency so far it's the last guidance I saw was however you receive the cryptocurrency that's how you know pretend it was dollars and and we'll tax it that way so if you bought some and you sold it at a higher price that's a capital gain we'll tax it as a capital gain and of course as it's capital loss if you lost money uh, I don't know how dividends work in that scenario because there's a different tax rate for dividends but otherwise you know and for me at least it's income um, if I get paid in USDC or something like that. Yeah, no, exactly. And I mean, that's what we need. You know, we need the government to help and figure out a tax regime. Like with even with Bitcoin, you know, there should be what they call a de minimis exemption so that if you spend $5, you know, at, you know, the coffee shop with Bitcoin, that doesn't trigger a tax taxable, you know, obligation. Right. And that's a huge problem right now. So it's, um, you know, you're right. I agree. Rather than trying to help you know the younger generation with this new technology and provide them kind of laws and regimes it's they just want to sort of like you know stop it oppress it and because they, yeah. they don't have, they're not they're not interested in it they, they don't have a stake in it which is sort of i think unfair to younger people who want to leverage this stuff to you know build their lives and build their careers and uh you know, it'd be nice to get a little more help but we'll see what happens cool uh last question here because i know you got to get moving uh, do you have any thoughts around um, some of the threats that journalists like yourself maybe are facing around the world? I don't know if you're, I don't know if Decrypt is getting any pressure from from any sort of regulatory agencies to maybe not report on certain types of uh, uh, projects or tokens or things like that because because the regulations are still so in flux. Uh, but what like maybe the Decrypt team or maybe some of your colleagues, you said you have a colleague in Venezuela, like, do you have any thoughts on on some of the threats that they're that they're facing now, just being a journalist or, or maybe specifically about being a journalist in, in crypto? Well, I mean, in, in crypto, not really the bigger threat is, you know, trying to hire people who are not corrupt. You know, unfortunately, early media, mm -hmm. a lot of the journalists were just bag holders who were not doing the job of reporting the truth or, you know, being critical of it when necessary, but simply, you know, shilling, which is not the job. But in terms of, you know, sort of danger to journalists, um, you know, I'm fortunate. I live in the U.S., which is very broad free speech protections. And, um, you know, I cover crypto and business. But you know, I do know people who are political reporters in places like, you know, the Philippines or South America and just the rising tide of, um, you know, authoritarianism, um, you know, because, you know, dictators never like the press and framing the press as the enemy and stuff like that. That's, you know, that's very dangerous. And, you know, I, I do know, you know, journalists who, you know, who's, you know, received death threats and, you know, you know, dozens of journalists are killed every year for the work they do, you know, they're reporting on Mexican drug cartels, things like that. Um, so, mm -hmm. you know, and I have enormous respect for these people. You know, I like to you know claim credit. I'm a brave journalist, but what I do is, you know, it's just sort of more interesting. So I'm very fortunate to be in a position where the type of journalism I do does not really put me in any danger, but there's a lot of, a lot of journalists, you know, working in a lot of places covering things that people don't want, you know, don't want them to cover. So, but in my case, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky to be, you know, in a, in a country that is, you know, still, despite, you know, the Trump years, uh, you know, it's still, there's a lot of protections for journalism. So on that note, but uh, yeah, so things are good. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, well, I know we got to wrap up here. So thanks so much for, for spending some time with us here today on Private Podcast. If uh, if people want to read more of what you're doing and, and putting out there, where should they go? Uh, go to decrypt.co. We have the best crypto coverage. It's smart. It's not patronizing. Check that out. And uh, if you want a background on we you know how we got here, uh, please do check out my book, Kings of Crypto. Terrific. 
Uh, thanks again, Jeff. And uh, thanks for listening today. Until next time, stay free.